So the next category um, is public policy. And this is always a hard one for the Heinz Awards because it's, it's often really difficult to point to specific policy changes and say, this person did that, this person is responsible, um, and to find, in fact, policy that is that exciting or that compelling. But the recipient of the Public Policy Award this year, I think, um, demonstrates the exact opposite. So Michelle Alexander, if I can introduce you. Michelle is a civil rights attorney. She is a, an advocate. Uh, most importantly, lately, she's the author of a book called The New Jim Crow. And rarely in the public policy realm can you trace one person's work to a change that is uh, at least in conversation and emerging in terms of, of local policies and federal policies, a change in how we think about a problem. And in this case, it's mass incarceration. What she uh, brought to the attention of the country is the dynamics of race and policing and mass incarceration in, in perpetuating an, an equity on our society that is deep and harmful, not just for African Americans in our culture, but for everyone in our culture. Uh, and the current conversation that's happening, including in Allegheny County, which plans to roll out its own reform effort later this year, derives directly from Michelle's extraordinary work and her extraordinary book that she shared with me earlier didn't get a whole lot of attention when it first came out. So perseverance pays off. Ladies and gentlemen, Michelle Alexander. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's really wonderful to be here, um, surrounded by so many beautiful spirits, people of all colors, backgrounds, walks of life who are here to celebrate work that strives to take us to higher ground as individuals, as communities, as a nation, as global citizens. And I want to say a thank you um, to the Heinz Foundation for honoring my work and by extension honoring the work of all of those who are committed to awakening our nation from its long colorblind slumber. Far too many of us have been asleep for far too long as our nation has birthed yet again an enormous system of racial and social control, a system of mass incarceration that is eerily reminiscent of eras we supposedly left behind. Now, I am always eager to admit that I didn't always talk like this or think like this. In fact, in the introduction to my book, I acknowledged that the first time I encountered the idea that our criminal justice system might be functioning much like a caste system, I rejected it out of hand. I was rushing to catch the bus in Oakland, California, and a bright orange poster stapled to a telephone pole caught my eye. And I paused for a minute, and I noticed that the big, bold print on the flyer said, the drug war is the new Jim Crow. And I saw that a small, radical community group was holding a meeting at a small church several blocks away. They were organizing to protest police brutality, the three strikes law in California, the expansion of the prison system, the drug war. The list went on and on. And I remember looking at that sign and thinking to myself, yeah, you know, our criminal justice system may be racist in a lot of ways, but it doesn't help to make absurd comparisons to Jim Crow. People just think you're crazy. And then I crossed the street, hopped on the bus, headed to my new job as director of the Racial Justice Project for the ACLU. <laughs> well, what a difference a decade makes. <laughs> For after years of representing victims of racial profiling and police brutality and investigating patterns of drug law enforcement in poor communities of color and attempting to assist people who had been released from prison re-enter 
into a society that had never shown much use for them in the first place, I had a series of experiences that began what I now call my awakening. I began to awaken to a racial reality that is just so obvious to me now that what seems odd in retrospect is that somehow I, someone who cared about racial and social justice and was a civil rights lawyer, that somehow I had even managed to be blind to it for so long. What I came to learn in those years as I actually began to listen to the stories of people cycling in and out of prison and began to do an enormous amount of work in research, and it blew my mind. There were one myth after another just began to fall away. I had once believed that the racial disparities and drug convictions had to do with the fact that, well, wasn't it true that most drug dealers were black and brown? No. The research for decades has actually shown precisely the opposite. Rates of drug use and sales are remarkably constant across lines of race and even class in many spaces. One myth after another began to fall away, and I began to see the extraordinary impact of the drug war in poor communities of color and how our criminal justice system operated in a way that bore almost no relationship to what you see on TV. <laughs> the drug war over the past few decades has destroyed countless families, destroyed countless futures, decimated entire neighborhoods. It has helped to lead to the birth of a penal system unlike anything in world history. In an extraordinary short period of time, in less than 30 years, our nation's prison population quintupled. Not doubled or tripled, quintupled. We went from a prison population of roughly 300,000 to over 2 million in a 30-year period of time. We have the highest rate of incarceration in the world. We sweep millions of people into our criminal justice system every year, primarily for nonviolent and drug-related offenses. But then once they're swept in, they're trapped for life. They're stripped of the basic civil and human rights, supposedly won in the civil rights movement, like the right to vote, the right to serve on juries, the right to be free of legal discrimination and employment, housing, access to education, basic public benefits. So many of the old forms of discrimination that we supposedly left behind are suddenly legal again. Once you've been branded a criminal or a felon, that's why I now believe that we haven't really ended racial caste in America. We've merely redesigned it. Today, there are more African American adults under correctional control, in prison or jail, on probation or parole, than were enslaved in 1850, a decade before the Civil War began. In large urban areas today, more than half of working age African American men now have criminal records and are thus subject to legalized discrimination in virtually every area of social, political, and economic life. This stunning development can't be explained simply by crime or crime rates. What we face today is not simply a legal problem or a political problem or a problem of power and politics. What we face today, what we have seen in our nation's journey from slavery to Jim Crow to mass incarceration is a profound moral and spiritual crisis, a recurring crisis of us as a failing to care, truly care, across lines of race and class and difference. And so I am so grateful to the Heinz Foundation and for all of those who have been waking up all over this country and beginning to join in this movement, a movement that is rooted in care, compassion, and concern for the least of these. Those we have treated as disposable, 
treated as though they are unworthy of our care or concern. And I believe that together, if we continue to do the work of waking each other up and being courageous, that we can, in fact, make America what it must become. Thank you so much for having me. Michelle, I think your, um, your book and your work was a revelation for a, a lot of us. I mean, there was really no dialogue about this in the country before the new Jim Crow came out and before you really sparked the conversation. But what was interesting at lunch was that you shared with some of us a, a story about how it was revealed to you. And this may consume the rest of this interview time, but I'm okay with that. I'd, I'd love for you to share that story with everyone here. Yes, well, you know, as I said, I, I, I was kind of a slow sell <laughs> on the notion that our criminal justice system was functioning more like a system of racial control than a system of crime control. And one young man really finally kind of jolted me into consciousness. And uh, he was a young man who called our office while I was at the ACLU. I was directing the Racial Justice Project at that time, and we had launched a major campaign against racial profiling by the police. We called it the DWB campaign, the Driving While Black or Brown campaign. And uh, we had set up a hotline number for people to call who believed that they had been stopped or targeted by the police on the basis of race. And within the first few minutes, of us announcing this hotline number on the evening news. We received thousands of calls. Our system crashed temporarily. We had to expand our capacity to deal with the volume of calls we were receiving. And we were looking to sue some police departments throughout California, um, about which we received complaints of discriminatory practices and tactics. And so this young man um, came into my office one afternoon after a long day of interviewing one young black or brown man after another who had been stopped or brutalized, searched by the police for no apparent reason other than race. And this young man, he was about 19 years old, comes walking to my office with a stack of papers about this thick. He had taken detailed notes of his encounters with the police over about a nine month period of time. He had dates of the stops, uh, who was there, if it was his cousin or his brother, who could testify to what had actually happened, whether he was forced to may lie spread eagle on the cement, whether he was hurt or brutalized or someone else had been roughed up. Um, dates, witnesses, just extraordinary amount of documentation and detail, very unusual to receive. And on top of that, he was extremely well spoken and he was charismatic and he was good looking and I just thought, here is our dream plaintiff. Um, the one we've been looking for is a lead plaintiff in the suit we are planning to file against the Oakland Police Department challenging their pattern of discriminatory stops and searches. And as I'm asking him more questions, he says something that really makes me pause. And I said, well, wait, you know, what did you just say? Did you just say you're a drug felon? And he gets quiet, and he's like, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm a drug felon, but let me tell you what happened to me. And he starts going into this big story about how the police planted drugs on him and beat up him and his friend and, uh, you know, telling me that, you know, look, I was framed, I'm innocent. I, I, just, I just took the plea because I was scared of doing the time. I just took the plea because I was scared of doing the time, but I'm telling you I'm innocent. And I was like, I am sorry, but I cannot represent you if you have a felony record. At that time, when people called the hotline, we were actually screening people who had felony records. We believed we couldn't represent someone as a named plaintiff in a racial profiling suit if they had a felony record because we knew that if we did, law enforcement and the media would be all over us saying, well, of course the police should be keeping their eye on him. He's a felon. He's a criminal. This isn't about race. This is about police going after the bad guys. And so we had been screening people with felony records and he hadn't, you know, checked the box. And so I said, you know, I'm just sorry, and I tried to explain, and he keeps giving me more information and details and the names of those officers, and I just 
shut him down. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We can't represent you. And then he becomes increasingly agitated and even enraged. And he says, you know, what's to become of me? What's to become of me? It's like, I can't get a job anywhere because of my felony record anywhere. He's like, I have nowhere to sleep. He's like, I can't even get into public housing because of my felony record. I have to sleep in my grandma's basement at night because no one else will take me in. So I can't get food stamps. You know, I can't even get food. I can't even get food stamps to feed myself. You know, what's, what's to become of me? He says, good luck finding one young black man in my neighborhood they haven't gotten to yet. They've gotten to us all already. And with that, he takes all of those notes that he had written, just starts tearing them up in tiny little pieces, throwing them in the air, and he walks out yelling at me, you know, you're no better than the police. I can't believe I trusted you. Well, several months after that, I'm opening up the newspaper in my office, and the Oakland Writers police scandal has broken. Turns out that a group of officers really functioning as a gang of police officers had been planting drugs on suspects, beating folks up, and who's among the officers identified as having planted drugs on suspects and beating folks up? Well, the officer he had identified to me as having planted drugs on him and beat up him and his friend. And, you know, I'm really embarrassed to say that it was only then that the light bulb finally started to come on for me and I realized, you know, he's right about me. I'm no better than the police. The minute he told me he was a felon, I just stopped listening. I couldn't even hear what he had to say. And so that was really the beginning of my journey <laughs> of asking a lot of questions, trying to understand why was it that we hadn't been able to find one young black man in his neighborhood they hadn't gotten to yet. What was really going on? And I started listening a lot more carefully to the stories of those cycling in and out of prison. And what I learned in that process really blew my mind and is what filled me with the motivation to try to wake up other people as well. Thank you. Thank you.